Um, so hello everyone. Um, welcome to another um, VTSS seminar. Um, today our uh, guest speaker is Otilia Bodia from Tilburg, Tilburg University, and our guest panelist is um, Janif Piperakis from Southampton. Um, Otilia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Adriana, and thank you, everyone, for inviting me to, to present. It's a very nice seminar, and um, I wish I would uh, attend it more, but I really like the idea that we, we now have a time series uh, seminar. So um, the paper I'm presenting is with uh, Mario Rothfelder, who is um, uh, assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam, um, and it's entitled Bootstrapping GMM Tests for an Unknown Threshold. Um, so we are looking at a time series model uh, where we have endogenous regressors. So it's uh, otherwise a linear model, but what is special about it is that we have um, threshold variable uh, that determines whether the parameters are changing, how the parameters are changing. So um, imagine this would be um, the unemployment rate or another indicator. It would be saying that if the unemployment rate is low, then the economy um, behaves differently than if the unemployment rate is high. Um, and this, uh, uh, low and high is defined by a threshold value. And in general, this threshold value is not known. So although there are several papers that impose a threshold variable, in general, it is not known. So we are looking at a, a, a linear model before, uh, un so for unemployment rate low, unemployment rate high, we have endogenous regressors. And this threshold variable, the unemployment rate, we assume that it's exogenous. Um, and the idea is, uh, and I'm going to motivate in a bit why we want to do this, the idea is to test for an unknown threshold using instrumental variable methods. Um, and what we do is we derive, um, so we propose some tests, a battery of tests, so a wall test, a Lagrange multiplier test, and um, something like you could call it likelihood ratio test or difference test is the difference in the GMM objective function uh, under the null and alternative rather than the likelihood uh, under null and alternative. And um, we derive their asymptotic distributions under the null and um, we also derive their local power. Uh, the problem is that typically in um, when you have a threshold variable uh, and the threshold is unknown, these asymptotic distributions uh, are data dependent. So they are highly non-pivotal and it's not easy to simulate them. And so what we do is we prove, uh, we propose um, a null bootstrap and we prove bootstrap validity um, both when bootstrapping under the null and under the alternative. Usually uh, you should bootstrap, and Adriana here might agree with me, that you should bootstrap under the null hypothesis um, if you can. Um, so when there isn't a threshold, uh, but we also do so under the alternative hypothesis. And the reason being that uh, such, uh, there is a walled test that was proposed in this paper by uh, Mehmet Janer and Bruce Hansen um, uh, in 2004 econometric theory, where they actually proposed a walled test for an unknown threshold in the same setting that we are looking at. And they proposed an alternative a bootstrap under the alternative. Um, and they referred to some other paper to check whether the bootstrap is valid, but actually we found out um, that a complete proof of bootstrap validity is, is missing. So there were some pieces I will explain later that were missing. Um, uh, this is not in any way to bash this paper because the paper's main contribution is not to propose this test. 
it is doing much more stuff, estimating threshold, showing threshold consistency of a threshold variable. So uh, it's uh, just a parenthesis. And I should say that I have worked on a similar topic uh, with Mario. Uh, it was, uh, the paper was called testing for a threshold model in models with endogenous regressors. So the uh, goal was the same, but our approach was different. We were using two stage least square tests um, and we decided that it makes more sense to focus on the GMM test. So now this paper is obsolete. Um, we also show in finite samples uh, that the wall test uh, is severely oversized. Uh, and initially, we, we weren't sure why this is happening. So I'm going to explain later. I first thought it's because of bootstrapping under the alternative, but actually it is severely oversized under both the null and alternative bootstrap. And we find that this Lagrange multiplier tests behave very well, although the likelihood ratio tests uh, are also behaving relatively well. Um, and um, there are more size distortions with the alternative bootstrap. So we propose that uh, this is done with the null bootstrap. And we have, um, I will show you if I have time, two empirical applications. Uh, one is a test for a threshold in the effect of monetary policy um, on financial and macro variables. Um, and uh, another one is about um, state dependent fiscal policy. So um, by the way, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. Uh, my, uh, our motivation for doing so um, is um, that besides the very large paper, uh, literature on threshold models in um, uh, IID settings and also time series settings. There is a recent search in uh, macro literature um, investigating whether responses of key macro variables to monetary and fiscal policies depend on the state of the economy. And uh, a lot of papers um, find a lot of evidence that this is the case. So, um, in fiscal policy, there are many papers. In monetary policy, there are many papers. But to give you an example, this paper by Ramey and Zubairi is a 2018 JP paper. Um, they, um, they are investigating whether the government spending uh, multiplier is different in recessions and expansions. And the idea would be that um, if that was the case, so if the uh, multiplier would be larger, so the fiscal multiplier will be larger in recessions uh, than in expansions, then it makes more sense to intervene in recessions. So by spending more. So, uh, but this paper does not find uh, strong evidence for a difference um, across the states of the economy. Um, there are many, there are several other papers, and um, I'm sorry I, that I'm not citing all of them on monetary policy, showing that, um, you know, how you set the interest rates and how you set the quantitative easing matters. So, this, depending on the state of the economy. And out of these, so they take various approaches, but out of these, a bunch of them are actually looking exactly at threshold models. Um, so these are of young at all and uh, Ramey and Zubairi, more recently Joe and Zubairi. And um, some papers have exactly our settings. So Ramey and Zubairi, for example, have a linear model with endogenous regressors and um, at least claimed <laughs> exogenous regressors. So you can uh, debate there. Um, there. There is a recent paper that explains why, why this threshold may not be completely exogenous. Um, but um, in any case, most of the uh, these papers are looking at impulse response functions or dynamic causal effects. They are using uh, local projection methods to figure out, for example, among others, to uh, 
uh, figure out either dynamic causal effects or uh, impulse response functions. And um, most of them also use instruments. So therefore, um, we feel that there should be a way to address the question of whether you can, uh, you have state dependence to begin with, uh, and not knowing um, what, whether the variable that defines the state dependence, not knowing where that state dependence ends, if the unemployment rate, at which cutoff is the unemployment rate regime different than another one. There is also an econometric literature on thresholds and some people uh, in the attending in the audience have um, uh, worked on this extensively. And again, I apologize for not uh, citing all the papers, but there is a large literature on exogenous regressors. So uh, starting with, for example, Tong and even earlier, Bruce Hansen, uh, Jesus, Con uh, Jesus Gonzalo, uh, Jean-Yves, uh, that is also attending uh, Hidalgo. So some of them are on inference, some of them are on uh, model selection like this one. Um, so checking whether you have zero thresholds versus one threshold versus two thresholds. Um, then on threshold regression with unit roots, there are some uh, proposals to do um, estimators of threshold models in a smoothed way. Um, there are papers on testing for thresholds. More recently, this paper, Giannarini et al., looks uh, basically proposes a Lagrange multiplier test for testing for an unknown threshold in um, auto in threshold autoregressive model. So that's an OLS setting. So how we differ from this paper is that we are doing this in an IV settings, um, and then the literature with. There are also papers in panel data, by the way, that I'm not citing here, and a lot of work on cross-section recently on threshold models um, due to the fact that uh, these were not, um, um, you know, there is a lot of developments on panel data on heterogeneity and group heterogeneity. So there are more papers coming up. Um, when you have uh, endogenous regressors, um, then, uh, the closest paper to what we do is this paper by Jenner and Hansen. Um, and when you also have endogenous uh, threshold variables, there is a paper that proposed a solution for time series models. Uh, and there is also this um, a recent working paper by Silvia Gonsalves uh, and, and several others um, that basically asks um, a very interesting question. If you have a, a estimate, if you're estimating a threshold, uh, if you want to estimate the dynamic causal effect, uh, when in the local projection setting, when does um, threshold estimation deliver that um, dynamic causal effect? Um, and so this paper is a bit related to what we are doing late, later that we haven't done yet. I'm gonna discuss it, but it's about estimation uh, with a fixed threshold, so a threshold that is known. And then there are some other papers with uh, cross in cross-section and short panels. Um, and these papers by Ping Yu and Peter Phillips and another one by Ping Yu, they, they also have um, endogenous threshold variables. However, the errors are IAD, so they don't quite fit the, the typical time series uh, context. And they are also non-parametric while we are looking at the parametric model. So the rest of, uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm first going to talk about uh, tests with Martingale difference error assumptions. I'm going to talk about bootstrap validity and I'm gonna discuss the extension to autocorrelated errors, just uh, what we have done and what we uh, need to do still. <laughs> so this is a very much work in progress. 
and the simulations and the empirical applications. Um, so I'll go to the model. So the model basically is the dependent variable is uh, yt. Um, so uh, the the regressor is wt. Now they they are split into so wt has two parts: an endogenous regressor xt and exogenous regressors z1t. And then I have some parameters theta one and theta two. Uh, and this theta one and theta two are different depending whether a threshold variable QT is below uh, gamma zero or above gamma zero. So in the fiscal policy example that I mentioned, uh, XT uh, was government spending, uh, YT was output, and then we have a threshold variable, for example, the unemployment rate or something else that's more exogenous, uh, so unemployment rate lagged. Um, and these government spending and output uh, are actually jointly determined within the border. So the uh, government spending is endogenous and it is instrumented with um, military spending shocks, an external series Z2T that was constructed by Remy and Subairi in that paper. So we are going to assume um, that ZT uh, are strong and valid. So especially it's important for Z2T to be strong and valid uh, instruments. Uh, and we have enough instruments. So either it's just identified or over-identified. And uh, to illustrate some, yeah, so to, to show you what I have we have done so far, we're going to make for now a martingale difference assumption. Um, this Martingale difference assumption is saying that the uh, errors, the conditional mean of errors um, is uh, zero given, and then QT and its lags. So this means that the threshold variable at time T uh, should not be correlated with that shock at time T, uh, but also the lags. Uh, and then uh, it's also saying that the instruments are exogenous. So ZT is uh, uncorrelated with epsilon T, a bit stronger uh, assumption of martingale difference, and then the, uh, um, also the lags. Um, this assumption, again, in the local projection framework, uh, it's by definition. It can be satisfied, but only at horizon zero. Uh, if you put enough lags in this regression, you would find that at horizon zero, this assumption could be satisfied. Um, but the errors are typically autocorrelated if you are looking of a regression of ut plus h on the same things. Um, and this can be shown uh, from a fundamental uh, vector moving average infinity representation. But for now, I'm just going to assume that these are martingale differences. Uh, since this problem was not solved uh, of testing parametrically for a threshold, even for martingale differences. Um, and for that, I'm going to, uh, to define the test. I'm going to define some full sample estimators and partial sample estimator. So the full sample estimator is basically just the one you know. It's an uh, over-identified instrumental variable estimators. That's why you see these six terms in here. And it depends on um, H. Uh, and H is a weighting matrix, and we need to pick the optimal H. So. Um, Assuming that the errors are not autocorrelated, we can plug in a, um, a heteroscedasticity robust estimator, H hat, based on some errors. And the errors, the uh, estimators uh, of these errors, the residuals, they are based here on the full sample estimator. So I take a full sample estimator. I have a first step estimator that would be a two stage least squares, for example. And then uh, I'm going to estimate the errors, plug them in, and then get my full sample estimator. 
this partial sample estimator depend on where I split, right? So which gamma I split on. And then I'm just estimating on the first subsample and on the second subsample, because this um, expression guarantees that the moment condition is basically hold at each gamma. So no matter where I split, um, I can get um, consistent estimators. So um, the partial sample estimators, so they are just based on the subsample and the same thing. The only question is here, and this question matters actually for applied uh, work because it will depend how your test statistics behave on what you plug in here. So this HI gamma is a estimator for the first subsample and the second subsample of this variance, of the variance matrix of the estimators. So there are multiple possibilities on how to construct them. This sum I gamma just indicates I1 and I2, so before QT is less than or equal to gamma, QT is larger than or equal to gamma. This is how I define the sum, the partial sums. So I could construct this estimator to plug it in here based on the full sample residuals, right? Um, or I can construct it based on the partial sample residuals. And we are trying to test the null hypothesis that there is no threshold right? Theta one is equal to theta two, in which case gamma does not matter. And the threshold variable is a sort of a nuisance that you have to deal with. So under the null hypothesis, um, there is no threshold. So these residuals will be accurate estimators. Uh, and then I can plug them in to get an estimator um, HIFS, which refers to full sample. And then I can also plug in the partial sample residuals. Uh, and those um, depend on gamma because uh, I would plug in residuals where QT is less than equal to gamma and QT is larger than equal to gamma differently. So I would have uh, residuals that are PS partial sample and they depend on gamma. Um, and that gives you the partial sample estimator. So I just denote in parentheses which weighting matrix I used to get the two-step uh, estimator. So that just differs in how I calculate the residuals. Okay, so uh, this is to be able to construct the wall test, okay? Now, to construct the Lagrange multiplier test, we need the restricted estimator. Uh, with the restriction, the null restriction, the restriction that theta one is equal to theta two. So what we do is we uh, write the sample moment conditions before gamma and then after gamma, stack them, assume they are asymptotically, in, they are asymptotically independent <laughs> under some assumptions. So therefore the objective a function then also then the, the test statistics will have uh, some weighting matrix in the middle that that is uh, diagonal, block diagonal. Um, and we're going to solve the sample moment conditions subject to the restriction that theta one is equal to theta two. And now when you solve this, um, objective function, yeah, so you try to minimize this objective function with respect to theta one and theta two. Given that theta one is equal to theta two, you obtain a restricted sample, a restricted estimator that is not the full sample estimator. Um, and the reason for this is kind of, a, so in, it's, it's because we have instrumental variable estimators. So in the OLS case, you don't have N1 hat H, H1 H, and one hat H transpose. You don't have three matrices here. You have just one, 
uh, and they are not inverse either. And so then this, you would have a first matrix here that is just a partial sum index by QT is less than gamma, partial sum index by QT larger than gamma. So when you sum them up, the gamma disappears. Uh, and same here, that's for the OLS case. But in this, in the, I, uh, in the um, IV case, uh, we don't have this. And therefore this estimator will also depend on gamma. So if we want to implement a Lagrange multiplier in its original idea to have the restricted estimators, then we will have this estimator not equal to the full sample estimator. Um, and the optimal estimator is based on, uh, so if we want to estimate uh, the second, we want to construct the second step, we would be able to also plug in uh, the residuals, but they again base, are based on, they depend on gamma because they are based on this restricted estimator. So we have three estimators, full sample, partial sample, and restricted estimator. Um, and so we could also then in, remember that in the partial sample estimator case, uh, we didn't, it wasn't clear what to plug in there for HI gamma. So we could also plug in the restricted estimator. Um, so I already said that the full sample estimator is different than the restricted estimators and the partial sample estimators that have these subscripts differ only in the way that the weighting matrices are constructed with what residuals. In the just identifying case, there are no weighting matrices, so they are identical. And then the wall test is uh, simply the difference. We are testing uh, theta one is equal to theta two. So this is just uh, theta one partial square, uh, so partial sample theta two had partial sample and the partial sample estimators of the variance of the difference in the middle. And this is exactly the wall test in uh, Jenner and Hansen. The LM test, uh, there is still a choice to make in the LM test on what to, uh, on, on how to plug in H and uh, how you choose this gives you different forms of the LM test. So we used the version from Andrews 1993 paper on change points and found out that in fact, the um, restricted full sample estimator just cancels out. So theta, this guy restricted is actually partial sample with the restricted H. So this, it turns out that the full sample estimator cancels out and so this, LM1 looks exactly like the Walt, uh, except for the estimator that we use. So the H is in the middle, okay? And that H in the middle also determines what H we plug into the estimators and then they will differ. And we could also plug in the full sample, uh, the estimator with the full sample residuals and it, that will give us an LM2 version. And under just identified case, the weighting matrices don't matter. So the only difference is in the middle of these three tests, okay? And now the uh, likelihood ratio test is more complicated because we want to compare the restricted and the unrestricted objective function. So this, here, this expression is just saying we are comparing, we are subtracting one from the other. Uh, and um, the two versions differ uh, again in what estimator we plug in. So, in the middle, um, the full sample, in the, the case of um, restricted estimators, we can use the restricted theta hat or we can use the full sample theta. And, so that gives us a different version. Um, we chose to keep the H's the same for comparison, but they could also be changed. Okay, and um, so 
with the, the assumptions, the rest of these assumptions are pretty similar to Janer and Hansen, um, but they are strong. So the series is strictly stationary, a raw mixing. Um, and ideally we would like to relax some of these assumptions um, and we need the fourth moment. Uh, this is basically saying we have enough variation for each gamma. We have strong instruments. It's very important that the threshold variable has a continuous distribution. Uh, and otherwise, a lot of the results we have uh, don't really work out. Um, and uh, yeah, and this is basically saying that for all gamma, the ex these expectations are uh, uh, positive definite matrices of constants. Um, and so the distributions you will see are complicated. Uh, in the case that the threshold variable is completely independent of everything else uh, and a bit more assumptions, then they look like the change point literature. So they are pivotal. They don't depend on the data you can simulate and uh, so on. You have the critical value, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, but since the threshold variable actually is not independent of the rest of the variables, um, there are more complications. And the main complication is that these expectations where you see here, mi gamma um, and ni gamma, they depend on gamma. So the fact that I impose, I introduce a threshold in this partial sum makes the moments change with gamma because then qt mo co-moves with wt and ct and other stuff. And that being said, if you define a zero mean Gaussian process with this covariance kernel, um, and then you try to derive the distribution, you will see that this is the, so we don't know the threshold. So we are taking supremum over all possible thresholds or, the, or maximum in practice, but the limit is supremum um, of gamma in, um, in a set, uh, capital gamma, uh, of these expressions. And um, I haven't, uh, I don't think I have, have I defined, uh, have I defined V? In any case, these are just expressions that you would normally see, but they depend on gamma. Uh, and it also turns out that the wall test and the LM test, the way we set it up, they are asymptotically equivalent. Uh, and I'm not even putting the likelihood ratio test because uh, in that case, you have two terms. So it's restricted un minus unrestricted objective function and things don't cancel out and it looks really nasty. Um, but for any of these three, it just doesn't work. We don't have critical values because they depend on gamma in a, in a very nonlinear way if you look at these expressions. So this, so basically first we needed to prove this. And when we try to prove this, we realize that in fact, um, uh, we don't have a, a uniform law of large numbers, even for strictly stationary and raw mixing series for these partial sums. Um, it was in Hansen, uh, econometrica paper, lemma one, but um, it made an assumption that you have a bounded PDF, which means that you cannot have normally distributed variables. So we, we first extended this to allow for normally distributed variables. And we could, um, with further results that are available in the literature, we could prove this, that these distributions are uh, the right ones. And this distribution, um, the supremum gamma and so on also appears in Janer and Hansen, but um, it doesn't, we felt like you need to extend this law of large numbers to be able to get this result. So they say you can get it, but uh, we couldn't. And then, um, so because it's they are so nasty, we propose to bootstrap them. Um, 
And uh, we just use a wild dependent bootstrap. We have martingale differences for the moment here. Yeah. So we're just multiplying the residuals with some eta that is IID and has uh, for uh, fourth moment. So this eta is typically the normally distributed standard normal distribution or rather uh, moment distribution. Um, and we also chose uh, not to add back the means. <laughs> so the, the risk, um, it turns out that depending on the test statistic that you look, so in asymptotically, this, um, uh, the true means sort of cancel out under the null of no threshold, the distribution of these test statistics do not depend on the true parameter values, only on gamma but not, so it's a supremum over gamma. They do not depend on theta zero and so on. They do depend only on second moments of the data that depend on gamma. So um, actually not adding back the means uh, is fine. In some cases, uh, adding back the means has no effect depending on which test you look at. Uh, and otherwise, it has no asymptotic effect for the null bootstrap. So we decided not to add the means back and just pretend that the data is the residuals. And then there is still the question of what to put here as epsilon, as the residuals. And the natural thing is to use the null hypothesis. So we uh, calculate the residuals with a full sample estimator imposing the null that there is no threshold. Um, these are pretty accurate if there is no threshold and then we multiply it with this eta. There was also this, uh, as I said, in this other paper, they proposed using the alternative hypothesis um, to bootstrap and that would imply that the pseudo true dependent variable, which is not, it will be now the partial sample the residuals times this eta. So, uh, but typically we don't want to bootstrap under the alternative because if we bootstrap uh, not, so in posing the alternative hypothesis, we kind of shift the distribution towards the alternative. So intuitively it should be more likely to reject and sometimes we can even invalidate the validity of the bootstrap. Um, okay, so first, is this bootstrap valid for the test statistics we look at? And it turns out that we need more assumptions. So in the paper, uh, we need more assumptions. We need the eight uh, plus something moment. Uh, I don't say that this is uh, necessary. I'm saying it's sufficient it's probably possible to get rid of part of these assumptions, but we uh, found our proof technique, in our proof technique, we found th that this is sufficient. And um, the idea is to uh, generate this variable, regenerate all the test statistics based on this new fake data where we didn't add the regression mean to the Y and then impose these assumptions, and then we can show bootstrap validity for all the tests. So Walt, the two LM versions, the two likelihood ratio versions, under the null. How about under the alternative? Um, it turns out that surprisingly to us, uh, this bootstrap is also valid uh, under the alternative, if you don't add back the means. So if you add the regression mean to the data, then this doesn't work out. Uh, so it will not be valid, but because you don't add back the mean, um, and this is what was proposed in Jenner and Hansen to not add back the mean, uh, you actually, the bootstrap should be valid. And in fact, it's the same asymptotic distribution. So under the null and under the alternative, you also get the same asymptotic distribution. Um, and we also found that uh, actually this result is, so this paper says that this result holds, but we found that what is missing to 
make this result hold is actually to show um, the quantity in the, that the quantity in the middle, the variances, the bootstrap variances converge to the true variances. And if you do that, you need more, you need this extra moment assumptions, which uh, they didn't have in the Jenner and Hansen paper. And in fact, this Journal of Econometrics paper by Gennarini, it's 2023, I think, or also point this out for least squares, which is, which is their case. Um, and we didn't check yet bootstrap validity for the other tests, but uh, I can show you simulations that, that it works out. Uh, so bootstrap validity under the alternative. Um, okay, I want to uh, talk a little bit about extension to autocorrelated errors. And this is uh, really, really preliminary. It turns out that it's not very easy to do, but it would be very useful um, for us to do that, I think. Um, so why? Because then we could actually uh, provide a test for state dependence for local projection estimators. What are local projection estimators for those of you that may not know is basically uh, in a simple case, you regress yt plus h on xt using some external instrument zt, and you do so at horizon h0, uh, h equals 0, 1, and so on. And in doing so, you may recover the true uh, dynamic causal effects that uh, are discussed in Stock and Watson 2018. So it's a sort of treatment effect of a shock. Um, or you can also recover the impulse response function of interest. Um, when you have no parameters changing, um, you can see this illustration here just shows why the errors in these uh, local projection regressions at each horizon are autocorrelated. Maybe to some of you, some of you know this, but just to make sure we are on the same page. So suppose I have two variables, y and x. Um, I have a vector moving average representation for them. Uh, in epsilon one, the structural shock for y, uh, for y, and epsilon two, the structural shock for x. And I'm interested in theta h. This would be the impulse response uh, of yt plus h on epsilon 1t. And under some conditions, it is also the dynamic causal effect um, of uh, one unit change in this epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 on y, uh, on uh, epsilon 2 on yt plus h. So this theta h is an object of interest, but if you put here y t plus h, theta h plus epsilon 2 t, the rest of the stuff are errors that are autocorrelated. They are uh, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 and epsilon 3 and so on. So these will be uh, autocorrelated over time. And then x t is from this equation is also epsilon 2 t plus something that's autocorrelated. So then you take xt, you substitute, you calculate epsilon 2t, you substitute it back into the first equation, and then you get the regression like yt plus h, theta h, xt, and then this ut plus h is autocorrelate. Now the question is, uh, the first question is, do we, is it possible to get a threshold at the horizon? other than zero, because so far we have talked about the regression of yt on xt, uh, martingale difference assumptions, but is it possible, for example, that we don't get a threshold at horizon zero? Well, we do have a threshold at horizon one. And to illustrate why this can happen, um, suppose I have, again, yt and xt, epsilon one and epsilon two, and suppose that I have this coefficient matrix A, which is different before gamma and after gamma. Yeah, uh, So it varies over time with Q or with gamma. So then suppose that I have a structural model like this. Omega times yt is 80, the coefficient that is changing, times yt minus 1 plus et 
which are the two shocks stacked. And omega represents the contemporaneous relationship between yt and xt. Then if omega is, notice that omega is not changing over time. It's not thresh, it's not dependent on whether the threshold is above or below. So then I have, uh, if omega is invertible, then I would have yt is equal to bt times the lag one of yt plus something. And if I do some manipulations, you can see that at horizon zero, there is no threshold because omega is not changing over time, but at horizon one, there is a threshold. So this illustrates that you can get thresholds not at horizon zero, but at, at a higher horizon. Um, okay, so then how would you proceed first? Um, we need, we have this, we are looking, let's say at one test statistic, uh, likelihood. Uh, so Lagrange multiplier, for example, this would be easy, but what you don't want is um, to estimate hack. So heteroscedasticity and autocorrelated versions, uh, estimators of the variance of a partial sum, because this gamma can be very small in small samples. So you have already just few observations and then you do a hack on very few observations. I'm sure that a lot of you have experience, not so good experience <laughs> with, with the hack estimators on very few observations. So the first thing we have to do is um, we have to um, go to the LM test. And in the middle, we have partial sums and we have to plug in something else in the middle. This will not be the LM test as in Andrews, but uh, we we should get rid of a hack any kind of hack estimations uh, on a partial sample. So we propose first you plug in a full sample estimator here for the variance h, assuming so it is under the null, assuming nothing is changing. Then um, to get the asymptotic distribution of the test statistic you need a law of large numbers, a uniform law of large numbers, uniformly in gamma. And we already did so, so I didn't state it here as a theorem, but we, we already verified this for a strictly stationary and ergodic uh, process. And so we don't need martingale difference assumptions, but we need ergodicity. There is still a question whether we need strict stationarity and I have not been able to resolve this uh, yet. Um, but we also need a functional central limit theorem for these partial sums. It's of functional in gamma. So again, this is more difficult than just a central limit theorem for a fixed gamma. Um, and so if this ZT epsilon T indicator function was strong mixing, then we can verify um, that the necessary conditions for a functional central limit theorem hold by just verifying the a bracketing condition that then, you know, uh, that bracketing condition then ensures that this corollary holds and therefore we have a functional central limit theorem. This bracketing condition basically is a sort of like stochastic continuity. You need to, you need to show this. Um, the question, However, remaining is what conditions, under what conditions is actually this quantity strong mixing or shall we impose weak mixing? Um, so when a variable is discrete, uh, uh, so it takes discrete uh, uh, values, is, it is not continuous, then you have typically problems with the mixing condition where this variable is involved. And then there is a lot of work by Paul Dukan and, and others. He, they also wrote a book on weak mixing, how you can relax this. Now in our case, QT is continuous. Um, we are assuming that it's it has a continuous P PDF, but there is an indicator here. And so I think that the problem is simpler. And I think that I also checked with Paul Dukan. 
Um, I think that it is possible to assume strong mixing, but we would like some conditions under which the strong mixing actually uh, holds. So when, when that is solved, then we can have a functional central limit theorem. We have the asymptotic distribution uh, of the test statistic. Then there is still the question to prove booster validity, but now the errors are autocorrelated. So we are um, looking into residual uh, block bootstrap. So we block uh, we block bootstrap the full sample residuals under the null. Um, and that uh, hopefully should uh, give us bootstrap validity. Okay, so this was the theory part. I'm gonna show you some simulations um, in the homoscedasticity case and a very simple heteroscedasticity case. We have a very simple model. Everything is scalar here. We have an intercept uh, and under the null, delta x is zero, so there's no threshold. And under the alternative, there is a small threshold uh, and at this point, okay? And uh, this point, so qt is independent uh, here. I No, sorry, qt is the instrument plus one. So it depends on the instrument. The instrument is normal one, one, and the errors are jointly uh, normally distributed. And we took the normal distribution for the wild bootstrap. Uh, and so you can see the null bootstrap rejection frequencies. Um, so when you bootstrap under the null, all the tests, and uh, under homoscedasticity and heteroscedasticity um, with the, so with, now with the full sample residuals that's under the null. And you can see that most tests behave well, except for the wall test. And something similar actually is present in the Econometrica paper by Hansen. He also um, actually says in that paper that we see some size distortions and we do not recommend to use the wall test. Their case is very, it's much simpler. It's a, a threshold model in the IID case, but still they, they actually um, find similar results. And uh, under the alternative, so if you bootstrap under the alternative, remember that we showed that the bootstrap for um, the wall test is valid, we still have to show that for the rest it's valid, but it seems to be valid because if you look at the LM test, you should get the nominal size of 5% and you do get them and for the likelihood ratio as well. But again, the wall test is size distorted and there is more size distortion than uh, under the null, but not much more. So the bootstrap under the alternative here is not the culprit, it's the quantity in the middle the quantity in the middle of the Walt test that was proposed in Jenner and Hansen that is based on the partial sample residuals. And the partial sample residuals have very few observations, so they're poorly estimated. And uh, then if you have, this is power, right? So again, under the null bootstrap, uh, this is the power. So the power is pretty similar across the tests and the same thing uh, under the alternative. Okay. Um, yeah. Otilia, you have about five minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, okay. And so I'm going to briefly talk about the empirical application. Um, this is based on Gertler and Karadi, famous paper. Uh, on the effect of uh, shock on monetary policy on credit cost output and inflation. And we want to investigate uh, whether we have state dependence, whether monetary, in this case, we define state dependence as whether monetary policy surprises are small versus large. And we want to see whether that has a, a different effect on credit costs, output, and inflation. So when surprises are small, um, then the effects on, for example, on inflation should be different than when they are large. This is what we are investigating. Um, the, so the regression is 
pretty much like what you saw before. We have exogenous controls. We have um, instruments which are constructed in Gertler and Karadi are surprises in the federal fundraise. And these are monetary surprises. And so we take the monetary surprises both as an instrument and as a threshold variable. Uh, this guarantees that they are exogenous. Uh, well, it guarantees, uh, there is a lot of discussion on this paper that the instruments are exogenous. Um, and so the regression we run is this. It is also possible to say monetary policy, if the interest rates are below a certain level, uh, the effects on credit conditions are different than if they are above, in which case Z2T would be replaced by a lag of interest rates. And I'm just plotting the test sequences. Uh, this The test sequence is basically just the test at each gamma over which we take the supremum and then bootstrap, right? Because we don't know uh, at under the null at which gamma, gamma is a nuisance parameter. So that's what you see on the x-axis. And we, we see the plot over gamma of all the five tests. And we see that we see the wall test is pretty behaving pretty erratically as opposed to the rest of the tests, which uh, whose movement is pretty similar. This is for a response of, um, it's for the response of a monetary policy shock for industrial production index. Then for consumer price index, again, the Walt test is pretty erratic, the others are not. And um, uh, this uh, was also, uh, so I forgot what EBP uh, stand it for, but it's also some uh, measure of excess bond prices. In, in any case, the same thing occurs uh, occurs here. And if we test for an uh, null bootstrap, we typically do not reject. But if you look at the wall test and the LM and L, LM1 and LM2, they should have the same distribution asymptotically. But the bootstrap, and this is a null bootstrap, you see that the critical values are wildly different. And so are the values of the test statistic, uh, which indicates that uh, perhaps this test statistic is not reliable and should not be used in practice without modifying it. Um, and if you take the other application, Ramey and Zubairi, you see a similar behavior for the Walt test. And if you want, to check the null hypothesis. Um, in some cases, you don't reject. In some other cases, you do. But again, you see the same asymptotic distribution should be the same asymptotic distribution, but the Walt test behaves poorly. So to wrap up, um, we developed several GMM tests. We still have some work to do. Um, extend the data sample for the first application, check for weak instruments, different threshold variables. And for the theory, we want to check uh, the validity of the bootstrap under alternative and extend to autocorrelation and block bootstrap. Okay. So. Thank you very much. I'm gonna stop the recording and then move to the chat. Thank you. Okay.